But today I'm going to begin by reading verses 25 and 26. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he has seen the Lord's Christ. This morning I want to bring a message entitled, Stepping into Divine Response. Stepping into Divine Response. You may be seated. And let me go ahead and share, there may be some times I may kind of get off just a little bit because even like the title, I mean I was, change, I was changing a lot of things this morning. So you just had to bear with me. But I, want, I wish that we today would face facts. See, at times it's, it's, it can be very difficult to maintain one's faith. We are faced with an untold number of difficulties in life, from medical issues to jobs, the, the pressure that society puts on us. And we could continue to go, but the list is rather extensive. It is, it's difficult for me to mention anyone that has not been praying in interceding over situations and people, and they feel as if their prayers are not getting answered. So faith begins to waver, and at times could possibly become non-existent. Take, for instance, in our account today, Simeon, the priest, who according to Scripture, he, it says right here, he was a just man, he was a devout man, and the one thing that I could add about Simeon is he was an extremely patient individual. And we'll begin to unravel his patience in a moment. He was that one individual that you might know who would say uh, that, 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 that that is a person who is the epitome or standard for everyone else. They live a life above reproach. And no one could say anything bad about this individual. I mean, do you know someone like that? Hopefully you do. I mean... God saved Sodom and Gomorrah if he could only find ten righteous. That's a message for another time. He would have been a very devout Christian. One of those people, he was all in all the time. See, uh, they love, he was one of those people that we, you know, have you ever said this about somebody? I mean, that's somebody that, now they loved him some Jesus. And no one could ever change their mind about their relationship with Christ. See, he was also... Uh, an extremely patient individual as he continued to pray and he continued to wait for what Scripture I just read to you said was the consolation of Israel. See, the standard in which we would all hope to achieve. See, what made Simeon so unique was his faith. And like many of us, Simeon had also received a word from God. This word was Simeon would not see death until he had seen the Messiah. So he lived each and every day with the anticipation and with the hope that maybe today is going to be that day. We just sang about it. Come, Jesus, come. Now, through his life, you know, it would continue to drag on. He might begin to question the word or thought maybe, maybe I've just missed this altogether. You see, the word that we receive as a church or as collective or as individuals individually is not meant to imprison an individual. But in fact, it, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is the word depart that you'll read later about Simeon. Because the word depart actually means to release, to untie a ship and set sail, to take a tent down, or to unyoke a burden. So his departure was not the departure that we've been thinking or taught this entire time, that he was about to pass and go see, you know, go to heaven and be with God. His departure was, he says, I am about to be released. I am a ship who's about to set sail, taking down my tent so I can move, and the burden that has been on me the whole time, this yoke is about to break. You see, the word is not, like I said, it's not meant to be a prison. But the word God gives you is meant to release you. 
Good Lord. Lord, help everybody over this, over this overload of turkey. I, I break the spirit of turkey over the body today. Ham, be gone in the name of Jesus. Y'all got to loosen up. Now, I know we missed Wednesday night, but come on, this is the Lord's day. He says, let us rejoice and be glad within. Not come in. See, y'all miss me. Now you don't know what's coming. Steps by going, oh God. The word is meant to release you and cause excitement not to be a burden. That's why God gives us the word. But what's Simeon waiting on? Luke 2.25 says this, Behold, a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, and this man was just about, and he says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. You can underline that because I'm going to tell you what that is. The consolation of Israel. Now, there are two separate schools of thought when it comes to Simeon. First, he was this aged man nearing the end of his life, but he held on to the promise that I'm going to see the Messiah. Now, the second school of thought is that he was not an, old, uh, an older man as we have been taught. But what we have not been taught is what it means or the prayer about the consolation of Israel. Because that prayer wasn't just for Simeon. The consolation of Israel was a part of every Jewish person's daily prayer. So age had no influence on this prayer. In fact, the prayer actually reads this way. May I see the consolation of Israel. See, it was the hope of the nation, the hope of generations, the hope of the world to be able to see and to be able to witness the coming of the Messiah during their lifetime. That was the prayer that they were praying, that I may see the consolation of Israel. And I believe we're a generation who's going to see the second coming of that consolation of Israel. See, Scripture doesn't tell us the age of Simeon. And, and, and we can ascertain that he had prayed this prayer for some time, perhaps the majority of his life. But he actually had his prayers answered. Because Simeon not only saw the Messiah, but God had ensured that Simeon actually healed the Messiah. See, this prayer had not been answered for everyone. In fact, there were many who had prayed this prayer throughout their lifetime. They saw the Messiah, they heard His teachings, and they still did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Some even passed away thinking, another generation has passed and no one in my time has seen the Messiah. Others may have begun to question the effectiveness of prayer and they began to wonder, well, I don't even know if prayer even works. Faith coupled with prayer is something that we must never give up on. We never know exactly how close we are to witnessing the fulfillment of everything that we've been praying for. And what I believe is even more dangerous is having your prayers answered and not even realizing that they have been answered. See, we could easily say that it was Simeon's lifestyle and dedication that captured the attention of God. And that is correct. It, 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 that would be a correct assumption. But what does have a major impact on receiving answered prayers? It could be, it could also be that we or that he continued to maintain his faith despite the circumstances. And that's also correct. Because we'll see here in a moment, Simeon didn't live in the best time. Israel was under Roman occupation, under Roman rule. There was, they were being taxed to death. They, they were uh, under, under a, a steep oppression. Look, religion had them bound and pressed down. They didn't know anything about relationship. They were bound by religion. And here's a man who never gave up his faith, even though he had prayed this for his entire life. May I see the consolation of Israel. May I see the Messiah when he comes. And he never quit 
and he never gave up. Why is that? He tells us, he tells us he, uh, it right here in the text. Look with me in verse 32. Luke 2, verse 32. He says, because later, let me, t- let me explain to you what's happening in this, in this thing. Gosh, there's a lot going on in these 11, 11 verses. It is about the eighth day or so after Christ's birth, so Mary and Joseph are bringing Christ to, to the temple to be circumcised. Part of the Jewish tradition or, or, or their, or their uh, religion. And so Simeon just so happens to be praying this his entire life. He just so happens to be in the temple that day when it's the eighth day after Messiah was born and they bring Messiah in when he happens to be his turn to do that portion of the priestly duty. I don't believe in circumstance and happenstance. I believe in divine kingdom connection. And so what begins to happen, I told you there's four verses in this text where it talks about how the Spirit of God is on Simeon. It led him, it guided him, and what you see here in the latter latter part is that the Spirit of God began to prophesy through Simeon. Because he began to tell everybody around under the inspiration of the Spirit of God what was the purpose of the child that he was holding in his hands. Then you would read a verse or two later where he looks at Mary and look, and to tell you how great the Spirit of God can influence somebody, he even prophesies to Mary and lets her know this child that I'm holding is going to be the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And a sword will pierce his side, but it will pierce yours as well. Just as a physical sword pierced the side of Jesus Christ, she was pierced in her heart watching her son die on a cross for all of us. So he began to move and he began to speak under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Part of this prophecy, and that's what I, because this is what helps Simeon, this is what's going to help us today. That's why I had to give you the backstory. Look with me, verse 32. It says, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now, as he's holding this child and he knows the child is the Messiah, what Simeon is saying in no uncertain terms is he's saying, this child is going to be a light and he's going to be a revelation. Some of you will accept him and some of you will not. That's that's one thing he's saying. But we're talking about stepping into a divine response. How and how do we step into this divine response? How do we move forward? And, and, and how does this influence us and help us today? Verse 32 begins breaking down this way. He says that first of all, Messiah is a light. Now when you begin to break it down in its original Greek, what you'll begin to understand that the word light is where we derive the word for illumination. Simple connection, right? Light, illumination. If we cut the switches off, no illumination. You're, we're sitting in darkness. But he says, but Messiah come to be a light. Illumination is that Jesus is the great teacher and the Savior of the world. And this is what he brings. He brings life and immortality to light in his gospel. That is what Simeon is telling everybody when he says, a light has come. In his word and in his message, is going to be life, there's going to be eternal life, and there's going to be light. It'll begin to awaken. See, illumination is more than just our intellect and our thoughts. Because illumination of the Messiah and who Jesus Christ is, is all about faith. Because the, because I gave it to you, the, 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 the theological definition of illumination. Because the light is a part of His gospel. The only way to accept the free gift of salvation, to walk or to step into a a divine response that we're building up to, is for us to understand who He is, why He came, accept it by faith. See, faith is the key to this this response. See, illumination is more than just about moving or or, or learning to trust God. It's, It's about trusting and obeying. So when the Word of God opens up and it becomes light and it begins to reveal inside of us multiple things. And one of those things is, or the, the, well, depend on, doesn't matter what it is, but whatever is revealed, it requires our obedience, our response. Paul writes it this way in Hebrews 10, 32. And that, that verse is not up there, so Katie, don't panic. It's, he's basically saying this. After being illuminated, 
or we come to the knowledge of the gospel, Paul says that we endure a great fight. So once we understand the plan, begin to understand the plan, the purpose, how to serve God, how we're being led by God, that it requires our obedience, the fight then begins to ensue. Because it becomes a struggle to maintain our faith without wavering. Now, this is one time you're allowed to raise your hands. How many at times you will, you will be bold enough in here this morning, brave enough to admit that my faith has wavered at times? Thank you for not leaving me by myself. See, you put both hands up. But we got to maintain, it's about maintaining the fight, is maintaining faith without it wavering. Without the ups and the downs or the hills and the valleys or, or man, did he say it or didn't he say it? Or against, here's the other thing that we, that we struggle or the fight comes in with faith. Fighting against those who would try to lead us away from our faith. See, that's a tremendous struggle in the day and age in which we live. Because there are, there are oh man, there's a whole lot of voices out there. But well, which is the correct voice? See, Simeon only spoke as the Spirit of God led him to speak. And that's why we got to have an ear of discernment. To know when is God speaking and when is it my own will and way. Or when is it God speaking or when has the enemy sent someone in my path to try to lead me away from God. So here's what ends up happening. The Bible describes it many ways, but I want to give you two. Because when we talk about illumination, Solomon describes it in Proverbs this way, because he calls it the candle of a man. In Proverbs 20, 27, it reads that the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. So it's the, it's the candle of a man. He says it searches all the inner depths of his heart. So the spirit of a man could be a man's rational soul. It could be the mind. It could be the intellect. It could also be the spirit of a man. But faith is a manner, matter of action, and illumination uncovers intent. So if the lamp of the Lord illuminates and reveals darkness, we got to get that under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's sin. But if the Word of God illuminates and it comes in and we begin to get direction, then now it becomes a matter of action. If God says, Paul, I need you to walk from this side of the stage to that side of the stage, I've got to be obedient, trust that the floor is going to hold me by faith, and walk from one step to knowing that God's leading me and guiding me. If He called me into it, He'll lead me through it and towards it. So it causes action. It's a matter of action. But this action uncovers intent because the light illuminates the heart or the soul of an individual. Why would I move from this side to that side? Is it to be obedient to God, what God has asked me to do? Or am I moving because... I want all y'all to see, I'm moving and walking with God. What was my intent for obedience? Is it for everybody to look at me and look what I'm doing that you're not doing? And any, 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 or is it me obeying God, not worrying about what anybody else thinks and saying, God, this is all about you? Because if I'm obedient and I'm walking under illumination, then it'll never be about me to start with. It'll always be about Him. If I'm doing anything that draws attention to me, then it's all in the flesh. It has nothing to do with God. But if I allow God's Spirit and His illumination to get into my heart, soul, show the intent, I've got to obey, I've got to move, and it'll always point to Jesus Christ. That's the difference. You can't act on faith and say you trust God when you don't even know God. See, it is a light set up by God within us. And what is that lamp of a man? It brings information. And it brings guidance. See, that's why I began this talking about Simeon had a word that he would not see death or he would not depart until he saw the Messiah. That was his word for his time. What have you been praying about? What have we been praying about and fasting corporately as this church? The word that started the inception of this church, that birthed this church. What have you been praying about individually? What God has been leading you to pray about because how He wants to move in your family, how He wants to use your job, how He wants to use you to affect. So you've got something individually you're praying about. We've got something corporately that we're praying about. And God brings all this together. And He does this because the lamp of a man 
God just doesn't send us out there willy-nilly. What does he do? We don't realize it, but this entire time, though your faith may have been wavering, though you may not understand where you're at, why you're going through what you're going through, are my prayers being effective, are they even being heard, what begins to happen is you don't realize this entire time, God's not only searching your heart and your intent, but he's downloading in you the information needed to get you where you need to go. He's been downloading in you this whole time. Let me show you. Look, right now, it's just as simple as walking across this stage. But later on, he might be guiding you to walk through some of the toughest parts of this town. But you learned the guidance here while it was easy. That way, when it got tough, God gave you the download. You know what to speak before you even get there. And then when you get, how am I going to get there? Put Pat and Charlie in action and start walking. Get in your car and go. See, you get the information and the Spirit of God gives you the guidance. The second word is the Lord's lamp. In Matthew 6, 23, it says, But if your eye is bad, then the whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? You see, this moral gift is a direct gift from God. Remember, the light, the illumination, helps us to see inside of us. So it reveals to us our true condition. That's the Lord's lamp, not the lamp of man. See, in order for man to know that he must be forgiven, he must first recognize his own spiritual state. So now we're moving beyond intent of the heart. Now God's looking to the depth of the soul. Are they mine or not? Have they asked for, for, the, for the forgiveness of their sins? Are their names written in the Lamb's book? Have they accepted the free gift of salvation? See, illumination is the light of the Lord shining into the deepest recesses of who we are. And he, he doesn't expose it to the world. There's no need. He exposes it to us. This is your shortcoming. This is what I have. Every how he speaks to you, this is, how, this is what I have against you. This is what I wish you would work on and correct if you want to draw closer to me. And he begins to reveal these things, exposing them. Because with God, nothing can remain hidden. All things must be confessed, and once they are confessed, they must be dispossessed. Did you catch that one? You got to let it go. Your past is your past. I don't know what you went through. I don't know who you are before I met you. I don't know anything going on in your life. But for you to move forward with the information that I'm giving you right now, then you've got to ask for forgiveness, receive it, and let go. Your past is who you used to be. It's not who you are now. And it's not where you're going. You've got to dispossess it. See, the enemy wants you to carry this burden the rest of your life. When God said you accepted this gift of salvation, don't carry it no more. Let it go. Cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, but quit fishing in the sea. God sent it there to be buried, but you keep digging it back up and want to keep bringing your past into the present. You can't go into the present dragging your past. You can't go and do all that God has for you if you keep dredging up what used to be. That's illumination. What else did Simeon say? Right there in verse 30, he says he's a light. And what's he going to do? He's going to bring revelation. Revelation is to make something known to us. And how does he do it? By divine or supernatural means. That means that something that is unhidden or is unknown until God, in whatever form, fashion, or whatever process, he makes it visible and makes it known to us. So when Simeon was working in the temple, like I said, Mary and Joseph was bringing him in for circumcision. That's a ceremony... They probably provide it every day. I mean, they're dealing with the whole nation. But God used it to reveal, here's the Messiah you've been praying about. What did He reveal to him? Revelation. He already been illuminated because he was a just man. He was a devout man. God had already searched the intent. The Spirit of God was on him, which at that time it wasn't on everybody at the same time. So he had to be a very special person. And so the Spirit of God was on him. So illumination had already worked in Simeon's life. Now God was showing him revelation. Let me reveal to you. Now this is where we all get hung up and it makes our faith waver. Every one of us. 
Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. See, that's where we get hung up. The secret things belong to God. We fuss and we fight and we waver in our faith. God, you didn't tell me enough. Well, I've already given you information. And I've already given you direction. The rest is mine. Right now, it's none of your business. But we struggle with that. We want to know the whole plan. It's on a need-to-know basis, and you don't need to know. Those secret things, like I said, hang us up, because by nature, what are we? We're curious. The house of God's full of a bunch of cats, and the curiosity killed the cat. You see, we, we want to know. We're curious. We want to know every detail. How are you going to work it out, God? Because I don't see how you're going to work it out. And, and we demand, God, we want to know every detail. We want to know where you're carrying this church. What are we going to see, God? See, if you knew everything, if you knew where God was carrying, if we knew the entire plan, there would, not, there would now be no more need for faith. Because if we knew the entire plan, one, I tell you, I'm going to just give you, can I give you an example? If God told me, and if I knew the entire plan was, Paul, you're going to, you're, you're going to carry this church, y'all are going to Africa, and you're going to start like 20 churches in Africa. I, I, when I finished saying amen, I'd be to the house, I'd be on the computer, playing tickets to Africa one way, ain't coming back. God speed to the rest of you, I, I'm going to start 20 churches. We would jump ahead of God's timing. But if also God gave us everything at one time, and we got to download, this is the entire plan. We wouldn't pray no more for the consolation of Israel. May I see the Messiah. In my, look, we would no longer pray. May I see the fulfillment of everything that God has spoken. May I see how God's going to use me, use my... That's why God retains a lot of things in secret. Because we, we would be terrible spies. We'd be telling everybody everything we know. Those revealed things are for the purpose Here's the purpose for obeying God. See, you're sitting there saying, but I don't know the whole plan. I don't know what to do. But whether you realize it or not, God's already given you information. And he's beginning to give you direction, guidance. He, whether, we take a, whether we're ever taking a step right now at this moment, does it matter? God's downloading in us a hunger, a desire. Can't you feel you? Can't, when I say this, because some of you I know have been praying for a long time, can't you feel in your heart and your spirit a longing or a desire for something? You have no clue. You don't know what your desire is for, but you know, I don't know what it is, but I want it. God, that's the download of information by the Spirit of God. That, now He's beginning to guide us, and we haven't even taken a step yet. You see, that's where this, re this revelation and all this begins because what we have received to this point is God revealing His commands and His precepts. His Word, His law. Now what we, you know, it begins to reveal to us what we should do or what God has commanded us to do. And then at the appropriate time, God will say, now take the step. How do we, we're like, well, I don't even know what step to take. You've already got the download. You already know it, and you don't even realize you know it. Because God has already given it to you. He's already carried you through a little trial, and all these trials are to prepare you for obedience. Everything we've been going through, everything we've been enduring, is so that God knows, I've got to carry them through this, because when I reveal this plan, when I reveal the next step, I need it to move like that. And so he, we got the information. He's been guiding us in His Word and guiding us through trials and through circumstances. And now He's got us at the precipice of what He has spoken. And we're about to step. In. To us, it's the unknown. But to Him, it's His will and His plan. So now He's saying, you got to trust me by faith and just do what I command you to do. It invokes a divine response. Because the whole plan is, is God's, so it's a divine plan of God. See, once God begins to reveal 
and He begins to show us the plan over our lives, we have a decision that we have to make. And I believe we've got to make it today. Are we going to obey God? Are we going to trust Him? Are we going to believe that He is God, that what He says is God who cannot lie, it will surely come to pass? If we believe those things, then we got to continue to live by our faith, not by sight, realizing that some of the things are the secrets of God. That's for Him to know. Some of the things have been revealed to us, and not only for us to know, but for us to pass to our children, that our faith is revealed in our response. And any hesitation reveals unbelief. So God is trying to remove the unbelief. He's trying to remove the lack of faith. He's trying to build our faith so that when the time comes, and it's a time for divine response, we do not hesitate. If God was to tell some of you right now, I have called you to go start 20 churches in Africa, you'd be like, oh God, you got the wrong number. Not me, God. I'm not because we're not there yet. Or we're not ready. Or, or God's still working on us. But when God gets you to the point that now He says, now I want you to go, you, what have I got to sell? What have I got to get rid of? Uh, let, me, let me see who I got to call. Let me call my children and say, look, Christmas is over this year. I'm, I'm going to head to Africa. We will respond. Why? Divine response. God has been downloading and dog God. I hope all y'all can see what God's been doing in your life and been doing in this church. God has been downloading this information. God has been quantifying everything. And we're now to a point where we're getting ready to have to make a decision. And I'm telling you, if we decide not to follow God, then the favor of God, the blessing of God, and the Spirit of God will be removed from this house. I'm telling you right now. So today we got to decide. When God says move, what are we going to do? Are we going to look at each other and say, well, let's see if He moves first. God might be calling you to move before He calls me to move. You've got to respond. How did He know to do it? Because the Spirit of God was on Him. Luke 2, 27. So He came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in uh, the, the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. So Simeon had entered the temple. Now get this now. He went into the temple long before Mary and Joseph had ever arrived. Simeon was a just man, he was a devout man, and he was a patient man. And though he had been obedient, even to the point of divine response, he still had to wait patiently for God to fulfill his purpose. Or in this case, make the necessary kingdom connection. Simeon was rewarded because of who he was, which is an everyday choice. His reward of, of holding the Messiah was based on his obedience. He was on God's timetable, and he was okay with having to wait. I'm glad my name ain't Simeon. Wait thing, I have trouble with that. I, look, I'm preaching to the choir. That's what I'm saying. I'm speaking from experience. I know how it is to be waiting, to be praying. You think your prayers ain't being heard, and you having to wait, and you see, and you're trying to be happy. I'm glad it's all working out for you. I'm glad, you know, I'm glad. Oh, God called you. You got like a 50,000 member. Oh, I'm tickled to death for you. Y'all are lying. Because there's a part in you like, God, why did you move them and not me? You know I've been serving you longer than they've been serving you. We've all been there. What led Simeon to make this connection was the influence of the Spirit of God in his life. He had not only learned to, to lean into and how to trust of God, but to obey the Spirit that was sent to instruct him. There are only 11 verses that are used to describe Simeon and the type of man he was. And of those 11 verses, four of those verses denote the influence of the Spirit of God in his life revealing to him his next steps, leading him to make the connection with Mary and Joseph, and then also using him to prophesy about the life and the death of Jesus Christ. How many times have we ever wondered what was going on or contemplated while we were heading in a specific direction? Have you ever considered that the journey might be much easier? Have we submitted to the direction of uh, 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 given to us by the Spirit of God? See, too often we struggle with what has been revealed to us. We fight against not fully knowing or understanding 
what God has in store for us and this journey that we have found ourselves on is just as much about obedience as it is faith. See, this is the point right now where we're at today. This is where faith and trust in God to the fullest collide. But the same spirit that was with Simeon also indwells every believer today. He is here to help us understand both the secret and the revealed revelations of God. And each, in each one of us, He's directing our steps to better understand the will of God. So there, whether we see it or whether we recognize it or not, because there's a group of people in today's society, if the church every Sunday is not hucking buck, then it was not a good service. If we didn't see like 20 people healed and this, then oh, that was, that, that was, God didn't show up today. But what we don't understand is God is showing up more when He's revealing and illuminating what is inside of us. God is moving more powerful in a service when people come before the altar. God, forgive me for being impatient and not waiting on your, your will and your time and your plan. It's about the activity of the Spirit of God in our life. Paul says in Romans 8, verses 7 through 9, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Simeon, was able to please God and obey God. Why? Because the Spirit of God was on him and in him and directing him. See, we forget, we, we cannot do it on our own. We don't have the strength, we don't have the capability, nor do we have the, the intellect to be able to accomplish a God-sized task on our own. That is why the Spirit of God is also known as the Helper. He helps us and He assists us in how we live. He helps us to be obedient to the call of God. And He leads us and shows us how to best serve God. So when He helps us, He's helping us to understand multiple things. I'm going to give you four things real quick. He helps us understand what God wants us to know. Now we just kind of talked about that, about revealed and a revelation. We talked about secret and, and what is to be known. So God, uh, the Spirit of God helps us understand what is to be known. It is, meant, it is not meant for us to fully understand everything right now. There are some things, I'm going to be honest with you, once God does reveal the plan and we're moving in it, there's still a lot of secret things you're not going to know until you're standing in the portals of heaven. Because that is not for man to know right now on earth. And you're like, well, God would never do that. He told Daniel after he finished writing the book of Daniel, seal these words up until the appropriate time. There are some things that are secret and not meant to be known now because if it was revealed, we couldn't handle it. You know, Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth. Y'all got. What's the second thing that the Holy Spirit helps us understand? To believe what God wants us to believe. Because let's be honest. Sometimes, isn't it hard to believe? I've had this talk with many people, especially the last several months. You take the Word of God and you start going through that Word. And there was a man who did not want, and I'm paraphrasing for time, a man who did not want to obey God. So God told him to go this way, he was going that way. And when they found out who he was, they threw him over a boat, and a great big fish come and swallowed him up. He spent three days with him. Really? How about, because our mind, we can't, we can't comprehend it. How about, we're not bowing to your God. So the king builds his fiery furnace, heats it up seven times hotter, and they throw him in, and when they throw him in, the people that threw him in burn up. But the people that they threw in, was walking around and they're like, they were on summer vacation. Right. <laughs> Daddy. How about a virgin giving birth? See, it messes with our minds and sometimes it gets difficult for us to believe. Here's the big one. And we, we sung it this morning. Why would anybody who does not know me or you, why would they lay their life down for us? Can you imagine, because I've tried to play this in my mind, and if I were God, a lot of people would be in trouble. Because 
what if, I, I always, you know, I play devil's advocate sometimes in my mind, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, what if somebody was to come to me, or, or, you know, it was in my plan, that you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take my firstborn, my only born, thank the good Lord, my only child. And, well, in this case, I have a daughter, so I'm going to send her to earth, born through the Virgin Mary, and I'm going to let her suffer the most horrible death that could ever be imagined on the face of this earth because I love humanity enough I want everybody to be safe. Could we lay down our lives for something? That makes no sense to us. Why would God choose us? Why would God love us so much that He would, lay, he, he would give His only begotten for us? It's hard to believe. He also helps us to understand the third thing. He empowers us to do what God wants us to do. I have shared with you many times that the mandate laid on this ministry, and it was just like Simeon, it was prophesied in this church a few years ago that this task is going to be so big that it can cause a spirit of fear. I've shared with, with you off and on. The task is going to be a God-sized task. Why? Because the only one who can complete it is going to be God himself. Why? So that only God gets the glory and not man. That's what we're walking into. Something that we cannot do on our own. It's not, what, but what the scripture says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. We can't do it. Not by might, not by power, not by intellect, not by ever how many degrees and shingles you got hanging on the wall. All that does not matter in the light of, he says, but it's by my spirit. Why? Because the spirit empowers us, the spirit gives us gifts. The Spirit is a helper. He is a lead. He is a guide. He illuminates. He brings revelation. He helps us understand the deep things of God. So for us to understand or for us to be empowered to do what God has called us to do, it's also not is leaning in faith and trusting God, but it's also trusting the leadership of the, of the Holy Spirit. That's why Christ ascended that the Holy Spirit would come down. And now just abiding in a person for whatever purpose that they had at that moment in time, like you see in the book of Judges or here on Simeon, once Christ died and then He ascended right hand of all, the Spirit of God was sent down to abide in all people at the same, all believers at the same time. But He also helps us to understand to be the person that God wants us to be. We're going to war against the flesh until the day we die. Or God calls us into rapture. Your mind, your, your thoughts, your mouth, your ears, everything will let you down. But the Spirit of God helps us to be more like God. In our nature, in our character, our actions, our speech, we begin to resemble more of who our Father is. And I think we all want to be better people. But we just sometimes we just don't know how. What does Simeon do? He prophesied by the Spirit. Look with me in Luke 2, 29, 31. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Remember I told you, being free, being loosed. Yoke broken, departing. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. Simeon began to speak what the Spirit of God was instructing him to speak. See, it was God working through Simeon to give divine encouragement to the body of Christ or to those listening for the upholding of the body and for spiritual progress. He instructed all who would listen. You know, like I, like I told you earlier, some will accept it, some will reject it, but all of you are going to hear it. See, we're living in a day and an age that what is the prophecy that's about to be fulfilled? That the, that the word of God will go to the, end, to the ends of the earth. The gospel of Jesus Christ will preach to the ends of the earth. And then what? The end will come. We are reaching a near end. And that's to me the same words that Simeon is speaking. All are going to hear the word. Some are going to receive, but some will reject it. He's saying this is your salvation. What is he instructing or what was he prophesying in john 11 25 and 26 jesus said to her he says i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he may die he shall live 
And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? See, the same Messiah that Jesus Christ was holding, he now say, he says, I am the answer to the sins of humanity. I am the answer that you've been looking for. I'm the only one who can bring life. I remove the, the bonds and the chains of death and the grave and of hell, and I bring life and I bring eternal life. Jesus Christ died a death that every single one of us in here were deserving of, that we should have taken on, but He laid His life down for us. That only by His sacrifice can our sins ever be forgiven. So He brings life. He brings immortality. The famous verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Holding on to our faith is more than getting prayers answered or knowing the will of God or moving in God's direction or allowing God to move this church. It is about spending eternity with God. And I, I just thought coming to my mind, but it's got, I got to throw this little caveat in there. But some people are so worried about eternity that they're no earthly good. You're not there yet. You're still a plan and a purpose as long as you got blood pumping in your body and breath. You keep breathing. God's got a plan. And it's not to sit here and keep checking off church. It's to go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't get so fixated on eternity that you don't fulfill the Great Commission before you go. Let me get back to the Word. People are fighting just to hold on to what little bit of faith they have. The fighting and the struggling is all going to be worth it when we eventually step into the portals of heaven. But he loved us enough that he, look, he personally prepared a place for us that where he is there one day we will be also. Let me close with this thought. Maintaining our faith is something that we must guard and nurture every day of our life. The effects of life in general will wear you down. Delays and simply being tired of waiting will cause one to grow weary and to want to give up on the faith. So we begin to question, did we really hear from God? Others would have us believe that there is no way that we could have ever heard from God. Because why would God use you? There's no way you can accomplish anything for the kingdom. Or some of you still might think it's impossible. Simeon proves otherwise. He led a life in a society that had turned its back on God. They were under the subjection of the Roman Empire. An edict was about to be released that would have called for the killing of the, newborn, of the firstborn or the newborn male children. And yet he continued to pray for the consolation of Israel. Consolation is seeking comfort after some sort of loss or disappointment. Who in this room has not experienced loss or who has not experienced disappointment? He maintained his faith. After centuries of disappointment, after centuries of loss, this wasn't the first empire that came and, 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 and took over and occupied Israel. This was about the like the fifth one. This wasn't the first time that their economy had crashed. This wasn't the first time that the, that the nation had turned their back on God and was no longer serving God. They experienced disappointment and loss for centuries. But he continued to look ahead, knowing and hoping that one day Messiah is coming. We have not gone so far as to have no hope or no future. We have been saved and we receive comfort by knowing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. If so, then we must look at it in this manner. If Christ is still Lord and He is still Savior, then we still must have faith. If Christ is not the Messiah, only then should you allow your faith to slip. But I don't know about you, but there's only been one Lord and Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. Our faith is built on the revelation of who He is and what He has done for us. So keep your faith.
Fight the good fight. Keep moving forward. We are no longer looking forward, but we have the opportunity to look back, realizing that the consolation of Israel has already come. He is here. He has died. He has, he, <laughs> he has gone to heaven. We can now look forward and know that just as He came the first time, guess what? He's coming back. He's coming back. If everybody please stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one.